um, I prepared a talk, but then this happens a lot. I get this other idea. <laughs> I want to talk about something else. And then what happens is I can't tell, did I ever give that talk? Or did I just have the thought of that talk? So anyway, um, recently I read a book, or got halfway through, because it was a big book, by Robert uh, Sapkowski called Determinism, um, which examines the question of free will. But one thing you could say it really is examining very, very closely is um, cause and effect. And at the beginning of the book, he gives uh, a description of when he was a university student. Um, you know, he's a very bright man. And he was kind of cocky and fairly sure of himself. He met a woman, I can't remember where we were from, but uh, more sort of traditional culture in the, in the East somewhere. And she described to him um, that in her family tradition, in her cultural tradition, the earth was on the back of a turtle, which I'm sure we've probably all heard that, that image of, of the earth being on the back of the turtle, the world being on the back of the turtle. And um, it kind of feels like, why a turtle, <laughs> of all things? But actually, I saw um, a video clip in one of the sort of nature documentary of how turtles and tortoises as well, um, like land turtles, because there are some land turtles, they kind of hibernate or go into a semi-hibernation in the cold months and they get all this mud on their back and it actually grows little plants. And so that then when they come to life in the warmer weather and they're walking along, they've got like a little world on their back, a little grasses and little plants, that some little flowering plants, almost like a little kind of bonsai world. And so you can kind of see, if we go back a few hundred, particularly a few thousand years, when there was far more wildlife, far less humans, people probably saw these turtles a lot. It was not an uncommon thing to see. To see, or you know, like imagine a big tortoise walking along with a whole kind of landscape growing on its back. That wouldn't have been a particularly rare sight, but for us, probably hardly anyone on the whole earth now gets to see that, because there's hardly only any of them, and most of us aren't anywhere where you would see them. So just as a sort of a side note too, whenever we hear of traditional stories from traditional cultures that sound kind of very strange and bizarre, they will, they will, we can trust, will have their roots in something that makes a great deal of sense. So the earth being on the back of a turtle actually makes sense. It just doesn't make much sense to us now, but we can trust that it made sense. And also, turtles actually do get on each other's backs. I don't know, you might know the, the Dr. Seuss book, The Children, Yertle the Turtle, about turtles all getting on each other's backs. So in, in in this um, exchange that uh, Robert had with this woman, he said in a somewhat kind of intellectual, cocky way, so what's underneath the turtle? And she said, well, another turtle. <laughs> and he said, and what's underneath that turtle? She said, another turtle. And then he said, well, what's underneath that turtle? And then she sort of looked at him as if he was a bit of an idiot, like, well, it's turtles all the way down, you know? It's turtles all the way down. And at the time, he just thought this was quaint, you know, just a quaint story about, you know, a, a quaint belief. But he said that years later, this image of turtles all the way down actually has become incredibly powerful for him. And since I've read that, I've, I've been finding it really powerful too, that, uh, in terms of causes and conditions, it's turtles all the way down. It, there's just no end to the relationship between causes and effects. There's just no end. You know, people often talk about things like, the war started when, and they'll give you a date when a particular thing happened. This country invaded that country and it started the war. Or this person assass assassinated this person and it started the war. 
But of course that's not the case. It's not just 12 turtles back <laughs> or 25 turtles back. It's turtles all the way down. It's turtles all the way down for us in terms of who we are right now, all the causes and conditions, day by day, moment by moment, everything we think, everything we say, everything we do. It's the same for everybody else. And it's the same for all the objects in our life. All the objects in our life and all the people in our life are where they are at this moment because of prior causes and conditions and whatever's going to happen to them will be because of causes and conditions of which we have only some influence. Some we have influence and some we don't. Um, I was talking to a Sangha that I'm very close to in Sebastopol, California. I'm a Diamond Sangha group there called Rocks and Clouds Zendo. I was talking with them the other day about how um, when, when we lost our house in the Black Summer fires here, how the first thought I had, which I'm so happy I had, was why not my house? You know, like, there's no particular reason that my house shouldn't burn down or that um, for any of us that anything, uh, that we shouldn't be the one that gets in a car accident or we shouldn't be the one that loses a job or g gets a, a diagnosis because the causes and conditions are so complex and when we, we can't pop ourselves out and say I'm immune somehow it doesn't it doesn't apply to me it doesn't apply to me that I can it won't happen to me yeah so I've just been thinking about that and there's uh, a koan in our collection which I think I have spoken about before but it's one of those ones that gets talked about a lot Pai Chang's fox. Um, it's long. <laughs> it's a long koan. So I'm going to read the whole thing out and then go through it a little bit. Case two in the gateless barrier. And this is the Robert Aitken translation. Once when Pai Chang gave a series of talks, a certain old man was always there listening together with the monks. When they left, he would leave too. One day, however, he remained behind. Pai Chang asked him, Who are you standing here before me? The old man replied, I am not a human being. In the far distant past, in the time of Kasyapa Buddha, I was a head priest at this mountain. One day, a monk asked me, does an enlightened person fall under the laws of cause and effect or not? I replied, such a person does not fall under the laws of cause and effect. With this, I was reborn 500 times as a fox. Please say a turning word for me and release me from the body of a fox. He then asked Pai Chang, does an enlightened person fall under the law of cause and effect or not? Pai Chang said, such a person does not evade the law of cause and effect. Hearing this, the old man immediately was enlightened. Making his bows, he said, I am released from the body of a fox. The body is on the other side of this mountain. I wish to make a request of you. Please, abbot, perform my funeral as for a priest. Pai Chang had a head monk strike the signal board and inform the assembly that after the noon meal there would be a funeral service for a priest. The monks talked about this in wonder. All of us are well, there is no one in the morgue. What does the teacher mean? After the meal, Pai Chang led the monks to the foot of a rock on the far side of the mountain. And there, with his staff, he poked out the body of a dead fox. He then performed the ceremony of cremation. That evening, he took the high seat before his assembly and told the monks the whole story. Huang Po stepped forward and said, As you say, the old man missed the turning word and was reborn as a fox 500 times. What if he had given the right answer each time he was asked that question? 
what would have happened then? Pai Chang said, just step up here closer and I'll tell you. Huang Po went up to Pai Chang and slapped him in the face. Pai Chang clasped his hands and laughed, saying, I thought the barbarian had a red beard, but here is a red-bearded barbarian. And then there's a comment and a verse, and I'll go over this because I know it's a very <laughs> confusing story. <laughs> Wu Men's comment. Not falling under the law of cause and effect, why should this prompt 500 years as a fox, 500 lives as a fox? Not evading the law of cause, effect, cause and effect, why should this prompt a return to human life? If you have the single eye of realization, you will appreciate how old Pai Chang lived 500 lives as a fox, as lives of grace. And then the verse goes, not falling, not evading, two faces of the same die. Not evading, not falling, a thousand mistakes, 10,000 mistakes. So the story is that there was a monk who came to Pai Chang's temple and uh, listened to his talks and he would leave with the monks and then some, one time he didn't leave and asked Pai Chang, uh, told Pai Chang about that he used to be a priest there, the head priest, and someone had asked him, does an enlightened person fall under the laws of cause and effect or not? And he replied that they don't. And then the effect of that was that he was born as a fox 500 times. So this, this question, does an enlightened person fall under the laws of cause and effect or not? In the Buddhist teachings, we answer both yes and no, or neither yes nor, yo, nor, nor no. So superficially, to think that we don't fall under the laws of cause and effect course superficially would be a grave mistake and people do make that mistake people make the mistake of thinking I've got my act so together that I can kind of get away with doing whatever I want all of us sometimes think that we can get away with something we can we can do something that won't have an effect but maybe people who have a lot of power are particularly susceptible to thinking that they somehow are above the laws of cause and effect. And they do great harm, thinking that uh, there's no real ramification for them. And maybe that's because sometimes, in a certain way, there isn't a ramification for them because they have enough wealth or power to not have to take responsibility. They can offload that responsibility to someone else. But of course it does have an effect on them. It erodes their sense of who they are. And it has huge effect on all sorts of people. But there are stories too of, of uh, spiritual teachers feeling that they somehow are immune. That they can do whatever they like and somehow get away with it. And of course causes great harm when they do that. So in some senses him saying an enlightened person doesn't fall under the laws of cause and effect, it makes sense that he was kind of, you could say, almost punished by being reborn as a fox 500 times. That's one way of, of seeing it and there's truth to that. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you're not, you know, that everything you think, say and do doesn't have an effect. Don't, don't fall into that trap. So that's one way of seeing it. The other way of seeing it's a much more subtle, and I really like this way of seeing it more, that the idea of falling under cause and effect as if it's a problem, like we are so lucky that we are subject to cause and effect. We are so lucky that everything is in this constant state of flux and each thing is affecting other things in this web that we can't possibly kind of pry apart the effects are so enormous, it's, it's so complex and untrackable and it's why life exists, it's why everything is the way it is. Of course there's this constant 
relationship going on. It's just like, it's just relationship, you could say. It's not even things, it's just relationship, just endless relationship. It's not something to um, feel that we're, uh, we're sort of subject to in a heavy way. It's like, it's our liberation. It's so fantastic. It's so fantastic that it's not static. It's so fantastic that it's alive and constantly moving. In that sense, we don't fall under it. We're liberated by it. So it's another way of reading that line. And so it wasn't an unwise thing for him to say. In a certain way, it was a wise thing for him to say, no, we don't fall under the laws of cause and effect. We are free because of cause and effect. It's another way of seeing that line. Uh, but he asks Pai Chang anyway, so I'd like to be released from this body of the frock. Fox. So does an enlightened person fall under the laws of cause and effect or not? And Pai Chang says, they don't evade the laws of cause and effect. And that, of course, is the caution to us. Not just a caution, but for us to, to very closely notice our own thinking. Like yesterday, I mentioned this in, the, in our koan class this morning. Yesterday, I got a little bit of news about a family member that just wasn't really great news. <laughs> And I felt kind of quite, kind of felt deflated by the news. And for a couple of hours, I just didn't have any energy. I just felt kind of like, oh, it's too hard. This life's too hard. You know? I felt a bit like that. This life's too hard. But I could watch myself having that thought. And after a bit of time, I thought, you know, you don't want to stay in this state of feeling like life's too hard for too long, you know, because it has an effect. So kind of almost felt like I was Velcroed to my seat, like, <laughs> pull myself up and go and get someone to give you a hug, you know? So I, I had, but I had to kind of like pull myself up. I had to pull myself up out of this feeling. But it was because of this teaching that everything that we think and everything that we do has an effect. And I knew it just wasn't good for me to keep sitting there feeling kind of defeated. It just wasn't good for me. It was okay for a couple of hours to feel a bit defeated, cry a few tears, but not good for me to keep on doing that. So I kind of pulled myself up and went into the house where my daughter and son-in-law live, and he could see that I was, you know, not feeling so great, and he gave me a big hug. And then my daughter gave me a hug, and then the kids just started saying, Nana, can you do this? Can Nana, can you do that? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> on we go, on we go. <laughs> Life goes on, let's, let's continue. So these teachings about cause and effect are very practical in the most ordinary intimate moments of our life. So we don't evade the laws of cause and effect. And so here in this story, uh, the old priest is liberated from the body of the fox and becomes a human again and then says, would you please conduct a funeral ceremony for my body, my fox body, and could you do it as a ceremony as you would for a priest? And I think what is so beautiful about this is it sort of speaks to the dignity that we have, that we live in this world of cause and effect. You know, that, we, that we live in it and that we get up each day and do what we can and deal with the difficulties of our lives. It's, it's a real act of grace that we do that. And it, we're worthy of having a, a, a funeral as priests for that. You know, we're worthy of that. Everybody is. Everybody deserves a, a beautiful funeral for having lived the life, their life, however they've lived it. Even people who have lived it, what you would say conventionally is very badly. They still deserve a dignified, dignified funeral. Everybody deserves a dignified way of being treated when they die. And of course, not just in their literal death, but in our moment by moment, moment by moment, we're being born and we're dying, moment by moment. So everyone you know, deserves to be treated with dignity in each moment of their life, each fresh moment of their life which is another way of thinking of cause and effect too, that each moment is a fresh moment. 
even though cause and effect is also so, even though, though it's turtles all the way down, still, here we are, fresh moment, new moment. Do we have free will in this moment? I don't know, it doesn't matter. But let's just do our best in each fresh moment, like the way I pulled myself up off the couch and went in to get a hug from someone. We, ha we, we can do that. So uh, Pai Chang leads the monks around the mountain to the foot of the rock and with a staff pokes out the body of a dead fox. And I find there's something just about that sort of poking out the body. It's sort of respectful, but it's, it's kind of how it is, a dead body, you know, poke it out. Maybe don't want to touch it too much with your hands, but you poke it out and they performed this ceremony for the dead fox. A respectful cremation ceremony. And then there's a second part to this this koan where Huang Po, who's a, a senior uh, monk himself, goes up to Pai Chang, who's the, the head abbot, and says, uh, you could say this is like um, a, dharma, a dharma exchange to see what will Pai Chang say when I say this. So he says to him, as you say, the old man missed the turning word and was reborn as a fox 500 times. What if he had given the right answer each time he was asked a question? What would have happened then? So this, I think, is a beautiful way for us to remember not to fall one way or the other, not to fall hard on we're all subject to cause and effect, end of story, and not to fall on the side. We're not really, every moment's a free moment. We can do whatever we want. We don't need to be tied by our past not to fall 100% on that side either. We fall and we don't fall. We fall and we don't fall. Over and over and over, we fall and we don't fall. That's our, that's our practice. That's the way in which we express the two truths all the time. We don't land heavily anywhere. So here, Huang Po is just seeing, what will the teacher say when I say something that's very dualistic, like, he said the wrong answer the first time and became a fox, and now he said the right answer and become a human again. What, what do you make of that? And so Pai Chang, continuing in the exchange, says, well, come up here and I'll whisper it to you. And as Huang Po comes up to him, they say Huang Po slapped the teacher in the face, but it's much more likely that he just gave him a little, little tap on the nose or something like that, because slapping a teacher would be pretty extreme. So he probably didn't quite do that. And uh, so in a way, what they're both expressing is, that's a crazy question. <laughs> and it's crazy to think you can come with one, one hard answer. There's not one hard answer like that. And so then uh, Pai Chang clasps his hands and laughs and says, I thought the barbarian had a red beard, but here is a red bearded barbarian which is a little bit like, you know, they sound like they're the same thing. We don't land, we don't, we don't get fixed, we don't get fixed anywhere. And then the, the comment, not falling under the law of cause and effect, why should this prompt 500 lives as a fox? Not evading the law of cause and effect, why should this prompt a return to human life? If you have the single eye of realization, you will appreciate how old Pai Chang, that's the original monk, because he was originally the head priest there, how old Pai Chang lived 500 lives as a fox, as lives of grace. I remember when I worked with this koan many years ago, I, I kept this line about living 500 lives as a fox, as lives of, lives of grace, it's really, it's really affected me to feel the grace in how we navigate our lives, to feel the grace in the difficulty. And I, probably all of us have watched another person very gracefully navigate something. 
and how instruct instructive that is to us when we see somebody else who's gone through a hardship and they've navigated it with grace. It doesn't mean they've navigated it with perfection, you know, not with perfection, but with grace. I think it's lovely when we see that in other people because then, then we can think, maybe I can be more like that. Maybe I can nav navigate my, my difficulties with grace. I do think it's good, and I've said this before, we have a tendency to imagine ourselves navigating things, often people do, kind of catastrophically. We imagine something terrible, how we won't cope with it. It's not unusual for us to, to do that, uh, for many people to do that. And it's a really good practice to, imagining, to imagine ourselves dealing some, with something gracefully, or to imagine ourselves having a calamity and imagine ourselves dealing with it with, with grace. Not with perfection, but with grace. It's good. It helps actually create that. That's an example of how cause and effect happens. If we imagine that, we actually will be more likely to navigate life's difficulties with grace or with skillfulness. So it's good practice. You can do that when you're just daydreaming. Instead of daydreaming something that's maybe not that helpful to daydream about, like what you wish you could have said to someone to put them in their place, <laughs> or something like that, or whatever else we might uh, daydream about. We can daydream about navigating things well with grace. And then the verse goes, not falling, not evading, two faces of the same die. Not evading, not falling, a thousand mistakes, ten thousand mistakes. And this, this um, a thousand mistakes, ten thousand mistakes comes up quite a lot in, in uh, Zen literature. But that's just how we're living our lives, you know, and it's okay. It's all one big mistake, that's another way it's put. One continuous mistake, and it's okay. We just do our best. So I hope this image of turtles all the way down, I hope that, that is something that captures your imagination a little bit. I haven't done a Google search, but it might be worth, I might try that, see if I can find an image of a turtle with moss and grass growing on its back. I'm just going to make it so I can see people a little better on the screen. There we go. Um, would anyone like to comment or ask a question online or, yep, Russ. Um, navigating situations with grace. This is an interesting concept to me. Uh, I have been uh, a dancer in this life, and so one way of relating to the word grace is as graceful as opposed to uh, 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 awkwardly. And uh, another way to relate to the word grace is from a uh, perhaps kind of a Christian perspective, un unearned assistance from the universe, one could think of grace as unearned assistance from the universe. I never heard the word grace used in a Zen teaching before, as far, at least I can't remember any right now. And um, I was wondering if you could say a little more about how you think of the word grace in Zen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think you're right. It's not a word that's used very often um, in Zen, Zen literature. I don't think it comes up that often. Uh, but one place I have heard it that I've also really appreciated is Pema Chodron uses the word grace. She's a Tibetan teacher, and she, she uses it. One place I've heard her use it that I've really liked is when we're doing zazen and we notice that we're not paying attention to our breath or not paying attention to whatever our meditation practice is and that we've gone off, and we notice that we've gone off and we come back, each moment... Each time we do that, it's an act of grace. She describes that as an act of grace. And uh, so if you do that 
many times in a period of zazen, that's fantastic. So in other words, she's saying, it's okay to drift off lots and lots of times, just notice and come back. And rather than thinking, that's a bad meditation I had, I kept on thinking about something at work, or I kept on thinking about a problem I have, or thinking about something I want to do. Um, she reframes it as it's a kind of grace just to notice that that's what you're doing and come back. And if you only get to come back once in a whole period of Zazen, then that's one big moment of grace. And if you get to do it ten times, it's ten moments of grace. And it's all good. Yeah. And it, when you think of it in that context, it, you could think of it a little bit as a kind of like mind training. But that doesn't feel as warm as just, just call it grace. Just leave it as grace. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jamal? Um, in listening to the poem you read, I, um, I was struck by, I guess, The thing that struck me in the being a fox or being a human and the, the kind of the, the, the reactions to the different answers is it almost felt like it was trying to drive home the sense of that duality of the, the answer. That, you know, there is, you, know, you are both subject to and not subject to the laws of cause and effect. And if one is to say, I am not subject to the laws of cause and effect, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. That's a really succinct way of putting it. I don't know if you could hear that online. Okay, I don't know if I can paraphrase it, but I'll try. That in saying that you aren't subject to the laws of cause and effect, suddenly you are. The effect is you are. But if you say you are subject to the laws of cause and effect, spontaneously you're not. I think that's really great. Yeah. It kind of feels like that moment when I, I went like, get up and go get a hug. That moment was kind of like a free moment. And we, ha we have, I mean, I've never quite resolved this thing about free, but I do have this sense that there's a, there's a split second in which a certain freedom is there. And that split second is always there. It's like that's all we have is these moments. Um, but we are still subject to laws of cause and effect at the same time. So it's just like can't, can't be pried apart. So, yeah. But maybe you could say, too, in the humility of really recognizing that we are subject to the laws of cause and effect, in our humility of really recognizing that there's a freedom, there's a, there's a freedom in a, in a fresh moment right there. Yeah, thank you. Fiona? Thanks, Rosie. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I feel very comforted by the by your words. And and what's coming to me is uh, last weekend I, I went to the beach and I was walking along the beach with a friend and there was a bit of driftwood which was stuck in the sand. And when I looked at it, I thought, oh, how, my, my feeling about it was, this is great. Like, it, it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's found itself at the beach, and here it is, and it's, and it's sort of half submerged, and, and I can see it as being stuck. And, and, and my friend looked at it, and she was like, oh, doesn't that make you feel stuck? How it feels to be stuck. So, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, so I'm just, yeah, just reflecting on that. I think um, uh, in, in neither is the correct way to do it, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. You could say neither or both. <laughs> neither or both. Like, it would, if she said to you, no, no, you're wrong, Fiona, it's a totally stuck. And if you said to her, no, it's not stuck, like that would just be an argument. <laughs> <laughs>
So what was so Fiona was describing how she saw a piece of driftwood in the sand and for her it didn't feel stuck it felt how did it feel it's found its place it's found its place that she thought it was just beautiful and found its place but the friend that she was with felt that it looked stuck and so we were just saying best not to try and say it was or wasn't stuck it was just what it was So we can think about ourselves that way too. It's not too good to feel too stuck by cause and effect, but it's not too good to think, ah, I don't need to worry about it at all. No, it's both. Yeah. Margaret had her hand up. Pardon? Oh, Margaret did. Okay, Margaret and then Bill. Sorry, Margaret, go ahead. I think you're still on mute. At Dubbo Zoo, you can see turtles, Gal Galapagos Island turtles. They're huge. They're out of the water. They all appear very clumsy and slow. And if a turtle wants to get somewhere, it climbs over the other one. Or straight over the top. And there are two turtles, and then another one comes along from the side and tries to climb up this turtle mountain <laughs> and falls <laughs> and comes again. So, yes, they do climb on top of each other. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so sad, isn't it, that we've filled the earth up with humans and the animals we eat. <laughs> left not enough space for all of the wild animals. I think we'll, a certain equilibrium will happen and it's going to shift and we'll get mm -hmm. more wild animals. <laughs> yeah. Any last, oh yes, Bill. Yeah, my, yeah, my question is just one thing that stood out in the story that I wanted to share is just the idea for the monks of that temple, um, like just the impression it must have made on them when their teacher went out to took them to this box and said, okay, let's get ready to do a burial for a priest. And maybe they were thinking back to maybe, you know, 15, 20 years ago when they last buried a priest and, <laughs> and they had to do this ceremony of like kneeling on priests again to grandeur or something. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, they must have really emphasised to him that perform this beautiful duty and all of that. So, yeah. yeah. Were you able to hear, hear that? Bill was just highlighting the part of the story where the monks um, must have been quite kind of surprised and, ta and taken in, like, had feelings when the the teacher took them around and found the body of the fox and then did this very formal priest ceremony for the burial. And I'm just wondering, Bill, what, what do you think they might have gained from that experience? Like how, how would that be something that could have been instructive to them, do you think? It would have been really confusing in some ways and made them question a lot of stuff. Like they would have seen monks die recently who didn't get such a grand funeral, right? Yeah. And then this fox gets one. Yeah. <laughs> and it would have been, a, a, in some ways, a bit confronting, but then it would have made them I think the effect that it has on me is like not to not to think any not to think anybody's not worthy of being treated well. Mm. Like even a mangy old dead fox body. Like the monks might have thought, "Wow, I, I tend to be kind of a bit disregarding of that mm. villager down the road. Maybe I should be a little more respectful to that villager down the road if if." the head teacher here is doing this ceremony for a mangy yeah. old dead fox. I also had the thought that the teacher might be getting on that age and is expecting to pass on in the coming years and to sort of make sure that there's not too much pomp sort of associated to his own funeral. Oh, like yeah. don't make such a big deal. Of it. so That's an interesting thought. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to make such a big deal about, um, like the head teacher's going to die at some point, Bill is saying. Uh, and so to do this beautiful ceremony for a fox also maybe helps the monks not to get too caught up with who gets these big ceremonies and, uh, mm. yeah. Yeah, the, these koans are very rich. You can take every line of them and, and find a lot of, of wisdom in them. Find and also generate. Like we generate it by the way we interact with it. Okay, we might finish up. Oh, um, Russ, want to say another thing? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, even though I have studied Zen for many years, I have never had a friendly relationship with koans, and I feel very blessed now to have you in my life so that I can begin to have a useful relationship with koans and benefit from them even when I don't understand them at all. And especially when you teach on one that I'm very familiar with, like this one, and um, and you invite people to give their perspectives, which may be completely different than how uh, a Zen teacher might present it, but but equally thought provoking and worthy and creative and helpful. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Russ. And, and I think that that's from having this koan class that we've been doing for many years now, um, where we are very open to inviting anything that comes up in relation to the koan, and it really has helped me trust in the creative process of how people engage with this very symbolic type of material, this, these sort of images. They're so evocative, and um, there's, so, there's so much. And it, um, it doesn't have to be like that really strict one answer, everything else is wrong way, you know. I think there's a way that we can still really respectfully open them up. Yeah. All right, thanks everyone. We'll do our chanting. I'll just turn the recording off. <laughs>